so let's go on in one point two. following two conditions of A. The first one is that the N must belong to A. And the second one is that if X belongs to A, then <laughs> X must be longer than A. Okay, so that's a natural definition for something we call minimum. But remember, your minimum must be interesting. Uh, there are several uh, consequences of uh, this definition. The first one is that we talk about the minimum because it's, there is only one. And we can't have two. And so first thing, the minimum is zero. It's not always that you have a meal, but when you do, uh, you, you must have a meal. You cannot uh, have two. So, how do you prove that? Well, assume you have two of them and show that you uh, they are the same. So, assume that M0 and M1 are both. By definition, we know that M0 is less than anyone in A. So since M0 and M1 are both in A, because they are both minimum, uh, being the minimum means that these two properties are true, then this must be true. But of course, there is nothing different between M0 and M1, so you can reverse the two, and you get that M1 is also less than M0, since M1 is a minimum of A and M0 belongs to A. And now that we have both inequalities, we say, well, M0 is M1. So after all, uh, they are not distinct. They must be. <coughs> Questions? Okay, uh, 
second consequence, uh, if you have only one element in your set, of course the minimum is that element. I'll just keep that one. Third consequence, uh, if A is included in B, then we have Okay, that's a convenient notation instead of saying I'm taking, I'm calling M, M0 a minimum of A, just you know, use directly mean of A for minimum of A. Uh, every time we need to be careful about this existence. Okay, we are assuming that they exist. Uh, this is quite easy too, to prove. Uh, what we know is that. Minimum of okay, minimum of A belongs to A by definition, but A is in B, is included in B, therefore minimum of A belongs to B as well. If minimum of A belongs to B, then we must have that minimum of A is larger than or equal to minimum of B. That's the definition of minimum of B. Every time I have an element in B, it is smaller than, I mean, it's bigger than the minimum of B. Okay, that's all right. So, okay, just, these proofs just use basic logic, but make sure you understand. Okay, so now that we have put our hands on minimum, we can state the piano sizes. And I should start by saying uh, there is a set N with the following properties. That's what we mean here. So N1 is that 1 belongs to N. N2 is that if N belongs to N, then N plus 1 belongs to N. And three tells me that uh, one, so, okay, I should have given you the definition of a successor first. So we need to include this. could just uh, uh, write this like this. Well, if so, n, n plus 1 is called the successor of n. And if n, if, uh, uh, n plus, well, if uh, N and M have the same successor then N and M are the same. 
because which uh, again is a triviality because you, you n and m having the same successor means n plus one equal to m plus one. Therefore, of course, n is equal to n. Uh, the reason we are we we state this like this is that, in fact, you uh, it's this notion of successor that defines the addition operation. Okay, that now we are using already what we know about the addition operation to get what we want. So, it's, so we are doing some things a little circularly here, but it's uh, we are just I'm just giving you these uh, axioms more for uh, general culture than uh, anything else. We are not we are just going to use one of them, and that one uh, will be clearer somehow. So, uh, did I skip one? Okay, so n3, yeah, n3 was not this. This is really n4, sorry. And n3 is the one is not the successor. of uh, any element of n. Remember that the natural start at 1. 0 is not a natural. That's why you have this property. And finally, the, the one that really is interesting to us is n5. If a is a non-empty set and a is in the naturals, then Minimum of A exists. This is also called the well ordering principle. Questions about these piano uh, axioms? Is there a, um, is there like a shorthand for exists? I think I remember something. Yeah, there is a mathematical symbol for that, which is this. Okay. However, you shouldn't mix English and mathematical symbols. You either write everything in mathematical symbols or everything in English. I know I do it sometimes, but uh, it's it's better to be consistent. So uh, let's see. Well, so the importance of the well ordering principle is that it guarantees that if your set of natural is not empty, you do have a minimum. And as you'll see in analysis, this is a constant thing coming back where you want the existence of certain quantities. And that's going to be very useful to us. Now, to believe that if I take a set of naturals, I have the smallest one, it's not very difficult. Okay, if I take all of the naturals, the smallest one is one. And you know, if I if I have any set of naturals, you can you know uh, intuitively uh, think that it's clear that there is going to be a smaller one, a smaller element in that set. So again, it's an axiom, which means that it must be something rather natural, but that you cannot prove. Uh, okay, so that's one of our starting points. Uh, we use the well-ordering principle to prove the principle of induction. So that's what we are going to do next. So the principle of induction says the following. Assume that you have a set P in N. You have a set P in N with the following properties. First property, 1 belongs to P. Second property, if N belongs to P, then N plus 1 belongs to P as well. 
Okay, so your set P must have these two properties, then P is actually all of the naturals. Okay? So that might not be the way you have looked at induction before. And it's really equivalent to what you're used to. And I'll discuss that in a little while. But for the time being, let's say that this is the principle of induction. Uh, how do we prove that? Let's do a proof by contradiction. A proof by contradiction means that the assumptions are true. Okay, we're assuming these two properties. However, this is not true. And we must reach a, con a contradiction. So, uh, assume that P is not N. Okay, it's smaller than N. That's what we're saying. So, uh, look at the set T, which is the set of naturals such that N does not belong to P. Okay, we are looking at the complement of the naturals in the naturals. T is not empty. Why not? How do I know that T is not empty? Is that what, that's our contradiction. Yeah, that's what we are assuming, that P is not N. If P is not N, it means that I have at least one guy in N which is not in P. So T cannot be empty. If T is not empty, the well-ordering principle applies. And I have a minimum. Let's call this minimum A. Now, I know that A is strictly bigger than 1. Why? How do I know that? That A is not 1. It's a natural, but it cannot be 1. Because we know that 1 is included in our set P. We know that 1 is in P, so it cannot be in T. T is precisely the set of numbers that are not in P. So 1 is not in P. Uh, I'm sorry, 1 is in P, so not in T. And because A is the minimum of T, we know that A is in T, so A cannot be 1. So A must be strictly bigger than 1. Now, A minus 1 is therefore natural. It's a natural because you have a natural which is 2 or more. You subtract 1, you still get a natural. Okay. However, if A were 1, and uh, I would have a problem here. I would get a 0. 0 is not a natural. I would be in trouble. That's why I need this first step. So now I know that A minus 1 is a natural. I also know that A minus 1 does not belong to T. Why not? How do I know that A minus 1 is not in T? A minus 1 is less than A. Right. So I have something less than my minimum, therefore it cannot be in my set. But not being in T means to be in P. Because that's you know, the definition of T. And then uh, we can say A minus 1 plus 1 is actually in P. That's because of this property here. We know that every time someone is in P, when we add 1, we are still in P. But this is A. So A is in P, but it is also not in P, because it's the minimum of a set of elements not in P. We have our contradiction. Okay? So A belongs to P, but 
A also belongs to T, and that's a contradiction. Therefore, the well-ordering principle, uh, the, the principle of induction works. And you see that the whole thing breaks down to this discussion whether your set is empty or not. Okay, so that's a crucial hypothesis that you need to check every time you are using the well-ordering principle. Otherwise, you are able to prove pretty wrong things. Okay, when uh, if, you, if you are not careful about your application of uh, the well-ordering principle. I'm yeah. Sorry. Can you explain to me why T is not empty? So by the the first point is to say I'm contradicting my conclusion, right? So I'm saying that P is not N. So if P is not N, it means that I have elements in N that are not in P. Oh, which is mean which means exactly that T is not empty. Okay, so that's the principle of induction and uh, Uh, let's let's do an example. Uh, let's prove that for all naturals and we have this formula holding. Okay? by induction. First step, uh, define some notation. You want to show in general that uh, this is equal to that, so call them different names. Uh, you, you want to show that they are the same, so don't start by assuming that they are the same, otherwise you are going nowhere. So let's, uh, let's call Sn the sum of the first uh, n naturals. Let's call An and n plus 1 over 2. And our goal is to show that for every natural, n Sn is equal to An. First thing, so, okay, uh, before we embark in this, let's, let's define P be the set of naturals for which uh, Sn is equal to An. And we want to show that P is all of the naturals. If we succeed, we'll be done. First uh, uh, remark is that S1 is 1. And A1 is 1 times 2 over 2, which is 1 as well. Therefore, S1 is equal to A1, which means that 1 belongs to P. OK, so that's the first thing we need to check for a principle of induction. Second thing to check is that if N belongs to P, N plus 1 belongs to P as well. So now assume that n belongs to p, uh, which means that Sn, which is 1 plus 2 plus n, is uh, An. Let's, yeah? Can we, uh, so in this case, can we let p be? The set of all cases where it works? That's right. Okay. But my definition, like yours, is precise. So, you know, try, try to get your notation and to say exactly what you mean by P. But that's what we're doing. That's right. So, Sn plus 1 is the sum of 1 plus 2 plus n over way to n plus 1. 
Okay, that's the definition. And this is a n plus n plus one. Because we know that the first the sum of the first n, the first n naturals is a n. And so this is n n plus one over two plus n plus one. So we get uh, n plus one n over two plus two. So this is n plus one times n plus two over two. So this is Sn plus one. But that's precisely An plus one. Okay, if I plug n plus one in my formula here, I get exactly n plus one times n plus one plus one, which is n plus two over two. So this is telling me that uh, n plus one belongs to P. So by the principle of induction, P is N, and this means that for all naturals, Sn is A. And we are done. In these proofs, the first step is usually easy to check that one is in your set. That's not a problem. But be careful when you, you show that if n belongs to your set, then n plus 1 belongs to it. Of course, you know what the answer is. And you may, you may be tempted to you know, be quick and say, well, uh, since this is true, this is true, without explaining how you go. Uh, that's not good. Okay, that's, that's the, precisely the point of the exercise, is to see that you know how to do these steps. Yeah, let's uh, state the alternative uh, form of the principle of induction, uh, because it's useful. So assume that S of N is a statement on N. And assume that S of 1 is true, is a true statement. Assume that if F of S of N is true, then S of N plus 1 is also true. then S of N is true for all naturals. Okay, and that's the way you have seen these things. Usually that's, it's not as precise as the previous definition where we define exactly what we mean. Uh, we have a set. P. Here we have a statement, we don't really know what the statement is, so it's, uh, it may be more easier to use, but uh, in some sense it's less precise. Anyway, you can use both. Of course, uh, there is uh, really not, there isn't much which is uh, particular to one. You could show that S of 100 is true, 
and then that uh, if S, S of n is true, then S of n plus 1 is also true. That will prove what? Everything from 100 on. Exactly, okay? What you cannot claim then is to say that everything is true for every n, because that's not true. But it's going to work from 100 on. So we always state with 1 because it's uh, uh, easy to, to be concrete, but uh, the induction principle is true starting at any point. But then your, your resulting uh, statement must start where you started, not, not anywhere else. Okay, then uh, as an application of these ideas, there is a long division in the naturals. How, how do you prove that you can actually uh, divide two naturals? That's what's done next. I'm going to skip that because we, we won't really need it. Uh, homework for this section. One point two. So this is also for August thirty first. One point two is five seven and eight. This is a rather important section because we are going to uh, show why uh, we need the reals and what distinguishes the reals from the rationals. Uh, first thing, as I mentioned before, is that square root of 2 is not a rational number. Uh, let's prove it, it's uh, easy to do. So assume that square root of 2, so again, you prove by contradiction. Assume that you can represent square root of 2 as a fraction of two naturals. Moreover, and that's the object really of um, uh, homework problem eight, every fraction, every rational has an irreducible representation, as you know, since little. Okay? Uh, however, if you want to, to, to prove that rigorously, you, you need to do something, and that's the object of uh, uh, number eight there. But uh, we'll just uh, use this fact. So we are, we are going to, to assume that uh, this is an irreducible representation of square root of 2. In particular, we are going to assume that A and B are not both divisible by 2. But we could be more uh, general than that. We, we are actually assuming that they don't have common divisors because it's irreducible. Okay, you have done all the simplifications you could, and you get uh, an irreducible fraction. But in particular, what, what would be important here is that they are not both uh, divisible by 2. Now, uh, by definition of uh, 
so maybe this is, this is something I should have started with. Uh, what do we mean by square root of 2? Well, square root of 2 is the only positive solution of the equation x squared equal 2. Okay, so every time you, you write square root of 2, now you'll feel guilty because you'll have to remember that what you mean really is that you are talking about the only positive solution of the equation is square, x squared equal 2, and we haven't proved that such a thing exists. Okay, we are just claiming this, and uh, that's where the real numbers will be important. We will actually prove that there is such a thing. But let's let's assume for the time being that there is such a thing, and let's assume also that uh, this is uh, this is uh, that the solution is also rational. So we, uh, by definition, we have that square root of two to the square is going to be two which means that a over b to the square is going to be 2, which means that a square over b square is going to be 2 as well, which means that a square is 2b square. So a square is 2 times something, which means that a square is even. But if a square is even, it means it, it's equivalent, actually, to the fact that a is even. And that's easy to see because if you take an odd number, an odd number is a number which, that you can write 2n plus 1, and then you expand this you get that this is 2 times 2n squared plus 2n plus 1. So when you square an odd number, you get again an odd number. When you square an even number, you get an even number. So the, 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 squ the square doesn't change the parity of uh, your numbers. So a is even, and if a is even, it means that I can write a as being 2a prime. So we write 2a prime square equal to 2b square. Okay, I'm just replacing my a by 2a prime because now I know that uh, a is even. And therefore, 4a prime square, it's not a great notation, but we don't need it for very long. 2b square. So we end up with b square equal 2a prime square. Which means that b square is even and therefore b is even. So we assume that a and B had no common divisor, and we end up with A and B has have a common divisor, which is 2. Okay, that's our contradiction. Since we are talking about this, uh, you, you, there is nothing uh, special, you probably saw this thing several times already, but uh, uh, people uh, sometimes don't realize that this is a rather general property of square root. Yeah, and if you look at uh, uh, problem 16, page 26, uh, it's you have a following result, which is uh, that either uh, n 
is a perfect square and square root of n is a natural or square or n is not a perfect square And square root of n is irrational. Okay, so there is nothing special about square root of 2. Same thing for square root of 3, square root of 5, 6, and so on. They are all irrationals, except for the perfect squares. Okay, so that's the first limitation of uh, uh, the rationals. And uh, we need a little bit more notation and definitions before we can state the fundamental property of the reals. So working towards that goal, let's first uh, talk about uh, upper bounds. So first definition. is an upper bound of A, which is included in the rails, if for all x in A, x is less than B. Okay, completely natural definition no so let's look at an example Let's look at the, the interval 0, 1. So I'm taking at all the reals between 0 and 1. Uh, could you give me an upper bound of A? 2 is an upper bound of A. So it's 1. 1 is also an upper bound of A. Remember, with this notation, 1 is not included in your set. But even if it were, it would work. Okay, 1 would still be an upper bound. Okay? And lower bound, of course, is in the other direction. So it's any number that's outside? Exactly. Oh, okay. okay. But the, uh, the, the quantity of interest to us will be the least upper bound. Okay, you want to concentrate on the upper bound, which is the closest to your set. So that's what we are going to s define now. M is a least upper bound. of A if two conditions M is an upper bound of A second condition if B is an upper bound of A then 
B is larger than F. Okay, among all upper bounds of A, the least upper bound is the one which is below all others. Okay, that's all we are saying. Okay, so everything is contained in the name. Okay, an upper bound, we know what it is, and least upper bound, okay, we can uh, just... Uh, and it, uh, it doesn't have to belong to the set. Though. Exactly, that's a good point. It doesn't have to belong to the set. And sometimes it will. In that case, we'll call it a maximum. But many times it will, it will not. It's such as the case in A. I'm sorry? Such as the... Ah, for this example, yes. So, based on the could be part of the set? Yes. Let's, let's look at a couple of examples. This time, take a set with one included. Then, if x belongs to b, x is always less than or equal to 1. Because that's the definition of our set. It's all numbers between 0 and 1. Okay? So, 1 is an upper bound. Now, take B, B an upper bound of capital B. There are too many B's in this. Then, B must be larger than 1 or equal to 1. Why is that? Why can I? be sure that my b is at least as big as 1. Yes? Because it has to be bigger than everything in that set. Exactly. One the exactly. So the reason b is, li is larger than 1 is because b must be larger than all elements in b. But 1 is in B. So if 1 is in B, uh, lowercase b must be larger than 1. With these two claims, we can conclude that a least upper bound of B is 1. And that's the same thing as for the minimum. When you have one, it's the only one. Okay, you cannot have two least upper bounds for the same reason. You just do the type of uh, double inequalities that we did, and, uh, and you get this result. Yeah, I like the notation uh, least upper bound. Uh, one, another notation which is convenient is this one too, supremum of A. Okay, but I like this one because it reminds you what the definition is every time. This doesn't, but. It's really up to you what to use. And sometimes uh, I'll use this because it's convenient uh, in equations when you, when you write, uh, when you have some algebra to do with supremum, uh, it's, uh, it's convenient to write it like that. So that's one thing. Um, okay. Uh, for the other set, Well, actually, uh, let, so let's let's go back to our a zero one. 
and, and this one, the one is not included. And you see how much difference a single point, the boundary question, uh, how important this is in, in these problems. So what's going to be the least upper bound here? Is there going to be one? And uh, what is it going to be? I'm sorry? Yeah. So it'll be one. It will be one again. But we need to prove it. So first step, if x belongs to A, then x is less than 1. Actually, it's strictly less than 1 this time. So 1 is an upper bound. By definition. I'm sorry? To prove that it's the least upper bound? Uh, yeah, we could use contradiction. So assume that uh, B strictly less than 1 is also an upper bound. Well, maybe this is not very well stated. Let's first let B be an upper bound of A. Uh, we want to show that B is at least 1. That's what we want to show. For any upper bound of A, an upper bound, uh, it must be uh, 1 or above 1. So by contradiction, assume that B assume that B is less than one. And pictures are helpful in these things. So you have zero here. You have 1 here. You have B somewhere here. And of course, it may be as close as we want to 1, but not quite at 1. It's strictly less than 1. So from where is the contradiction going to come when we assume that B is strictly less than 1? There are elements that are, that are bigger than B that's going on. Right. I could take someone in here that is strictly bigger than B, therefore B is not an upper bound. And I'm done. But let's be precise. What should I take? B plus 1 over 2, for instance. I take the midpoint. This is something which is strictly between B and 1. Okay? So B plus 1 over 2 is strictly between B and 1. Okay, you just uh, you can solve inequalities and check that this is true. And so B plus 1 over 2 belongs to A. Well, I, I should assume that my B is bigger than 0, of course, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So B plus 1 over 2 is in A, and B plus 1 over 2 is bigger than B. B cannot be an upper bound. Okay? So these are uh, very important uh, little proofs that you need to do. Okay, you need to be able to do that. You, you'll be asked to do this type of reasoning all the time. So make sure you know how to do it. Okay, so 
so now we are uh, able to state the fundamental property of the real numbers. So if you take A non-empty and in the reals, if A has an upper bound then it has a least upper bound. So, if you have a set which is bounded above, you can always find a least upper bound. And that's not true for the rationals. Okay? It's this property that will allow us to show uh, that square root exists. Square root of 2 exists. Now, there is nothing particular about uh, upper bounds. Uh, we can redo the same thing with lower bounds. So we can restate the fundamental property of the reals uh, using lower bounds. And so same thing as before. A is different from the empty set and A is included in the reals, if A has a lower bound, then it has a greatest lower bound. Okay, so it's a symmetric problem where you have your set A somewhere in here, a lower bound is something which is below all the elements of your set. The greatest lower bound is the one you can get which is the closest to your set. Okay. All the definitions for lower bound and greatest lower bound are given to you uh, in the notes, page 19. So. Yes. But rational is a subset of the real. Right. So, so it has, you can, you, you can take a set of rationals A. And it has the fundamental properties because as you're pointing out, you are in the reals. However, what you don't have is that your greatest lower bound is a rational. It's a real. That's the problem. Okay, that's, in that sense, I, I'm saying it doesn't hold for a rational. It's because you don't end up with a rational, like square root of 2. The thing exists, but it's not a rational. Are you going to be proving that? Proving what? That uh, this principle doesn't work for the... Uh, yes, rational. I'll give you an example, and I can give it to you right now. Uh, take the set of rationals. such that the square is strictly less than 2. And this set is bounded above, is not empty. Now, 1, for instance, is in this set. It, therefore, it has a least upper bound. But the least upper bound is square root of 2. Right. And square root of 2 is not in the rations. And that's, you can just make it happen yeah. you choose the bounds. Yes. Okay. Sometimes it will be true. I mean, uh, when I'm saying it's not true, I mean it's not always true, that's all. Okay, okay you have this look on your face like uh, this is enough. So maybe let's stop here and uh, we'll continue on Tuesday, this section.